morning, church. Welcome to worship on a beautiful Sunday morning. Good to have you all with us. Uh, If you're worshiping with us online, we're glad to have you joining us. Uh, If you would just say hello in the comments and let us know you're there, we would we would be very happy if you would do that. We also have this tradition. uh, Not sure again where it came from, but uh, we give our online community a wave on Sunday mornings just to let them know that uh, that we acknowledge that they're there. We know they're there, and and we appreciate that uh, even though distance uh, separates us, we are all uh, the family of Christ, and we are all uh, uh, worshiping together as as family. So, uh, if you're here in the sanctuary, uh, at one end of the pew or the other, you'll see a blue. Uh, uh, pad. If you would fill that out at some point, that's our connection card. Uh, if you would fill that out at some point, we would appreciate it. We want to know that you worshiped with us as well. Uh, it's also a great way to update contact information or to share uh, joys and concerns or uh, other information with the pastoral staff here at FPC. Uh, for those of you in the sanctuary, everything you need for today's service will be projected on the screen. Otherwise, uh, there are some bulletins at the back of the sanctuary if you want one of those. Uh, There are also Bibles and hymnals there in the rack uh, in the pew. If you'd like to have the Word of God in your hand during the service or uh, you want to have the the words and the notes, uh, that's there for you as well. A couple of announcements as we get going this morning. Uh, Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, Uh, is the funeral for Shirley Jennings. That'll be here in the sanctuary again tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And then on Monday, uh, March 4th, uh, we'll have Mary Weber's funeral here. Uh, Fred and Judy, our sympathies to you. And uh, so that'll be at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary, 10 o'clock visitation. Uh, So please uh, mark that on your calendars as well. Uh, As far as things today, Uh, We have our Entering the Passion Bible study that will meet in the chapel following worship. Chapel is downstairs in this corner. If you take the stairs down through the social hall, uh, you'll find it. Uh, If you don't want to come to the class, you can always join us for coffee and goodies. Again, down those stairs and and into the social hall. And we'll have a time of fellowship uh, and an opportunity for conversation. Uh, We have a midweek meal here at FPC. It's Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock. If you're looking for an opportunity to uh, have a meal with church family, uh, you're invited to attend. Anybody's invited uh, at 6 o'clock downstairs in the social hall. We just ask that if you are going to come, you call the church office or email the church office and let us know you're going to be there so that we make sure we have enough food. Uh, to feed everybody, but we would love to have you join us for that midweek meal. Um, Thank you from the Helping Hands store. You'll see there a total of 2,251 diapers and a large box of wipes. Uh, Fortunately, I don't remember what it's like to buy those uh, anymore. (laughs) But uh, thank you to everybody who who contributed. Um, A directory of members is available at the back of the sanctuary. And then uh, you can read the other announcements there as you have time. Uh, See, that's all I have. Uh, Let's uh, take a minute to reach out, greet our neighbors, and, and we'll get going with worship.
While you return to your seats this morning, uh, I do want to point out, I jumped over, we are uh, on Facebook, Twitter, uh, and I don't think we're on TikTok or Instagram yet, but if you want to follow uh, the church and what's happening, look for us on Facebook uh, or on Twitter. We'd love to stay connected with everybody during the week. Uh, here at FPC, we believe church isn't really about um, religion or, or dusty doctrines, the way we think of uh, typical church or historic church. Instead, um, we like to think it's about relationships. It's about our relationship with each other. It's about our relationship with God. Uh, the most important thing we do as a family of faith is love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, we want this to be a safe place for people to ask questions, for you to express doubts. Uh, we don't run away from those things. In fact, we embrace those things because as we talk about that stuff, um, that's how we grow closer to each other uh, and to God. Uh, that's how we grow in our faith uh, and our spiritual life. So we don't shy away from those things. We embrace them. Uh, at FPC, we uh, affirm the worth and value of all people. So it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, who you love. Uh, you are welcome in this place. We are an open and affirming congregation. And so we would love to have friends and family join us uh, for worship and, and fellowship and, and to be able to support one another on this journey of faith. Uh, you will find no judgment here, just grace, mercy, and love. Uh, today we enter worship with the words of Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. The foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, hold fast to my covenant, all these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Let's make this a house of song as we open worship, and let's stand for our opening song.
Join me in the opening prayer. Holy God, creator of life, you call us out of the dark places and offer us the grace of new life. When we see nothing but hopelessness, you surprise us with the breath of your spirit. As a worship today, call us out of our complacency and routines. Set us free from our self-imposed bonds and fill us with your spirit of life, compassion, and peace. Give us a wisdom, a vision of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Help us examine our lives and show who we really are. Expose those places where we are in need of forgiveness and grace and deliver us from the temptations that draw us away from you. Loving God, lead and guide us through this season of Lent as we seek to become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Help us to take up our cross and follow, spending each moment of our lives living in response to your unconditional and eternal love. And now, Lord, bless the worship we offer today, that it might glorify you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, your appointed one.
like to invite all the children and youth and young at heart to come forward, please. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you today. So one of the things that we believe is that Jesus was 100% human and 100% God. Um, and when we say 100% human, we know that Jesus knew what it was like to be a human being. And that's why God sent Jesus down to help us, to help us learn about being more like Jesus, who was a human but also had God's gifts. And when you're 100% human, you have all kinds of different emotions, right? You feel happy, you feel sad, you feel hungry, you feel frustrated, sometimes you're mad. There's all kinds, you feel joy and excitement. All of those were emotions that Jesus felt. And sometimes we like to think of Jesus as this guy who kind of walks around with a stoic look on his face and really has no emotion. But one day he got really, really angry and he was at the temple, and he saw all of the business that was going on at the temple, because in the Jewish faith, they believed there were certain things that needed to be done um, to help practice their worship. And one of those was to buy animals to sacrifice, and one of those things was to trade in their Roman money for temple money so they could give offerings. And so they had booths outside with all these things going on so that people could buy animals or trade in their money or do what they needed to do in order to go in and worship. And what made Jesus mad was that sometimes those things, the way that they were worshiping, got in the way of why they were worshiping. And he got really, really angry. And he took a whip and he knocked over the tables and he let the animals go and he called the place a den of thieves. That sounds pretty mad, right? He was trying to tell people that you are not remembering why you worship. And you know, we might like to point at the people in the Bible and say, well, you know, we know better than them, but we don't. Sometimes we let our practices of what we do to worship get in the way of why we worship, and we worry about everything being done just so, rather than worrying about are we really coming in with the heart for worship? So Jesus could get mad, sad, joyful, hungry, sleepy, everything that we felt, Jesus felt. And that's why Jesus understands exactly what we're going through as human beings. And that's pretty cool. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much that you sent Jesus to live with us, to be like us, to feel like us, to experience like us. It's that knowledge that helps us know that Jesus knows what it's like to be us and can be with us in the best of times and the worst of times. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may go back to your seats. The eternal question, what does it mean to be fully human and fully God? I love to think that Jesus had an incredible sense of humor. Um, you read some of the stuff he says, and he has to have had a beautiful sense of humor. Um, if you are not easily offended, I recommend a book called Lamb, L-A-M-B. I cannot remember who the author is, but there's this great scene in the book where Jesus is a child, and he's playing with uh, a lizard, and he keeps crushing the lizard and bringing it back to life. Um, you know, I like to think Jesus had a sense of humor, uh, since we have a sense of humor. Although, as Sarah said, Jesus did have days where uh, that weren't so that weren't so good. So, during Lent this year, we are working through a series of messages based on the book "Entering the Passion: uh, A Beginner's Guide to Holy Week" by uh, A.J. Levine. Um, early Christianity use this Latin word, passio, uh, to describe the last week of Jesus' life. And I mentioned last week um, that in early Christianity, that Latin word uh, was translated as suffering. 
uh, and it's carried down through the ages. And in Latin, that is what passio means. However, in modern English, uh, the word becomes passion, like dedication or devotion, something we love. If we look at the life of Jesus, three things stand out that he cared the most about. Uh, he cared about justice, he cared about human flourishing, and he cared about the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. And it was that passion that led to his suffering and death. And there is no doubt, uh, Jesus suffered greatly at the hands of the Romans. But in more modern English, we need to look at what that word means now. And last week we talked about Jesus risking his reputation uh, by leading a, a, what was basically an anti-imperial protest parade into Jerusalem. Today we're going to talk about Jesus risking, his re, uh, risking righteous anger as he enters the temple and as, uh, as Sarah told the kids, drives out the money changers and the vendors. Uh, it looks to us from a very high level, like an act of anger, maybe even bordering on rage. Uh, for centuries, that's how the church has uh, envisioned this scene. Uh, and we've tossed around multiple reasons why Jesus seemed so angry. You know, the vendors must have been cheating the poor. Uh, the religious leaders were uh, uh, working with the Romans. Only the righteous were being allowed access to God. Anybody else taught something like that at some point? Uh, and that's why Jesus was so mad? Um, I'm going to challenge uh, a little bit of that today. Uh, before I do, let's bow for a word of prayer. Merciful God, help us to seek you and the message you intend for us in your word read and proclaimed today. Amen. Well, all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, all four Gospels tell this story of Jesus entering the temple and, and doing what we call cleansing, uh, cleansing the temple. Uh, Mark was the source material for Matthew and Luke, so we call those the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic is just a fancy way of seeing together, saying seeing together. Well, why say seeing together when you can say synoptic, right? Um, John, on the other hand, is really, really different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, mostly because, well, it's John, and John's a little wackadoo. Uh, John's a little bit like that crazy uncle that comes for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, but each author was, was basically sharing what they thought their audience needed to know. Uh, and for John, what was important was the spiritual side of Jesus. Uh, John was concerned with uh, that divinity part. Um, if you have your Bible or you want to follow along in a pew Bible, we're going to look at uh, uh, Mark mostly today, but we, we may talk a little bit about John. Uh, we're going to start with Mark 11, verses 12 through 19, on page 823 uh, in the Pew Bibles. Church, listen to what the Spirit is saying to us today. On the following day, so that's the day after Palm Sunday, on the following day when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. His disciples heard it. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and he began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. When the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him. 
for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. So fun fact, uh, this scene takes place uh, during the Passover, so one of the uh, big holidays in the Jewish faith, uh, but it happens in March or April. And in Jesus' day, anyone and everyone would have known, as Mark puts it, it was not the season for figs. That includes Jesus. Uh, but Jesus is hungry, and he expects the tree to have fruit on it for him because, well, you know, he's Jesus, right? Uh, but it doesn't. And when he doesn't find any, he curses this tree into permanent barrenness. Uh, anybody else think that sounds a little bit like an abuse of power? Uh, or maybe, honestly, maybe like a petulant, angry child who isn't getting his way. Well, Mark has a reason for telling the story that way. Uh, the destruction of the fig tree provides the reason for the cleansing of the temple. Uh, neither the tree nor the temple are bearing fruit, uh, Jesus expects them to bear fruit, um, and when he, when he doesn't find any, he curses the fig tree, and then he goes and turns over a couple of tables in the temple. Uh, what we're looking at are symbolic acts rather than practical ones. It wasn't like Jesus was cleaning the temple out for eternity. Uh, no more buying, selling, anything like that. Um, it, it was not a practical act. It was a symbolic act. To understand why, we have to understand some things about the temple. So uh, it's kind of small, but hopefully you can see. So the temple was actually about the size of 11 or 12 soccer fields laid end to end. So this place was huge. If Jesus went in and turned over the tables in one part of the compound, it would not have caused chaos anywhere else. Uh, the temple was made up of multiple courts. There in the center is what they called the Holy of Holies. Uh, this was, as you might guess, the most important place in the temple. Only the high priest could enter this court and only on Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. Uh, only the priest could go into the Holy of Holies and ask God to forgive Israel's sin. If the priest came out, that was a good thing. But if the priest died in the Holy of Holies, not such a good thing. Uh, I don't know if there's any case in Scripture uh, or in history where the high priest died in the Holy of Holies, but that's the way it was set up. Uh, the, the high priest may or may not come back out. And if he doesn't, well, Israel's sins are not forgiven. Uh, the temple at the time of Jesus served many different purposes. Uh, it was a house of prayer for all nations. It was the site of three pilgrim festivals, uh, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. It was a symbol of Jewish tradition. Think uh, the Statue of Liberty. It was the National Bank, and it was the only place in the Jewish world where you could offer sacrifices to God. If we think back to Luke chapter 2, after Jesus was born, uh, Mary and Joseph go to fulfill the ritual requirement of sacrificing a pair of pigeons or, or turtle doves. And where they go is the temple in Jerusalem. The temple was not like church as we think of it. Uh, it was a tourist attraction, really. Uh, it was always crowded. It was always noisy. But since it was Passover, uh, the people would have been celebrating, so it would have been even more boisterous, even louder than normal. Uh, a fun place, I guess, to hang out and meet your neighbors and relatives. Uh, and the outermost court of the temple was called the Court of the Gentile. Uh, this is where the money changers and the vendors would have been set up in that court 
of the Gentiles. Uh, when pilgrims came to the temple, they brought money from their region, Roman money, uh, but only a special Jewish currency could be used in the temple, uh, what they called Tyrolean shekels. Uh, so these folks had to exchange their, their Roman money for Jewish, special Jewish money. Uh, it's just like, think, just like if we traveled to another country. Uh, also, Jews coming to make sacrifices on a pilgrimage to make a sacrifice in the temple did not bring the animals with them. There was too much chance that the animal might hurt itself, something might happen to it, it might run away on the way there, uh, and the animals that were used in the temple had to meet some specific requirements. Uh, so folks didn't bring those animals with them. Uh, they were bought at the temple, not brought to the temple. Uh, and there's no indication that people were being cheated by uh, the vendors or the money changers. Um, what we do know is that uh, uh, the money changers and the vendors basically had to be there. Uh, they had to be there if uh, Jewish pilgrims were going to fulfill their religious obligations. So either Jesus was having a really, really bad day, or there's more to the story. And just a hint, it's more than, there's more to the story. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells the crowd, and this is back in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus tells the crowd, I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. Now think about that as you think about Jesus' anger in the temple. Was the anger Jesus expressed in the temple contradictory to that teaching? Was it wrong? Was Jesus saying one thing and doing another? If he was, is, is it right for us as his followers to express anger and outrage the way Jesus did? So, personal story. Not an easy one to tell uh, because I still find some... Uh, I have feelings around it, and I'm not trying to process that. But uh, When I was about 11 or 12, uh, I was playing backyard baseball uh, with friends. The neighborhood bully was pitching. Now, he and I hadn't gotten along since probably we were in the womb. Um, if you'd asked me back then, I would have told you I hated this kid, and he would have said the same. Uh, now, I know we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves, but as a child dealing with bullying, uh, that's a hard thing to do. Well, as I stepped into the batter's box, uh, he called me something that, well, it isn't for polite conversations, and it's not a word we use in church. Uh, I did a childish thing, and I responded uh, in kind. I responded right back to him. Well, I stepped into the batter's box. I looked down at the plate, and as I was bringing the bat up and turning my head to look for the pitch, the ball hit me square in the mouth. I ended up with a fat lip and some loose teeth. Um, when I got up, the bully was, you know, doing what bullies do, pointing, laughing, and making faces. Uh, I was madder than I think I've ever been in my life. Uh, and it wasn't just anger. It was rage. Uh, I grabbed the bat and I started walking toward him. And suddenly what had been laughter became fear. Uh, and I'll never forget the look on his face as he turned and started to run. Well, that wasn't good enough for me, so I took the bat in both hands and launched it at him. Uh, unfortunately, my aim with the bat was as good as his aim with the pitch, and it caught him on the back of the head. Uh, four stitches later, I find myself standing in the dining room of his house with my mom, who is 
angrier than I've ever seen her in my life. And this kid's irate father. Uh, and of course, it wasn't the bully's fault. Uh, he claimed it was an accident. He thought I was ready. Uh, the pitch had gotten away from him. Uh, didn't matter that he'd knocked my teeth loose. I had drawn blood. I was forced to apologize, and when we got home, boy, was I punished. So there are different types of anger. Uh, there are different ways of showing anger. Now, anger is a normal human emotion. It's okay to be angry. We can control anger. But there are times when anger turns to wrath. That's anger that's out of control. It's rage. Maybe it's even hate. And wrath can lead to a desire for revenge. That's why I'd put my anger that day in the backyard. But Jesus' anger was different. In Mark chapter 11, verse 17, Jesus alludes to two passages from the Hebrew Scripture. Uh, he says, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. So the first half of that is from the Scripture uh, we heard at the beginning of worship. Uh, Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. It's a beautiful passage that actually welcomes us, that welcomes Gentiles into worship. Gentiles had traditionally been excluded from worship. The second half is from Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. The prophet says, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal? Will you go after other gods that you have not known and then come and stand before me in my house? Just called by my name and say, we're safe, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? You know I too am watching, says the Lord. Whenever Hebrew scripture is quoted in the New Testament, uh, you have to go back to the Hebrew Scriptures and look at the context of that and if you want to understand uh, the context of the New Testament passage. Uh, so the house, uh, as we know, is the reference to the temple. Uh, so den of robbers or den of thieves, as Sarah said, uh, that's where we get this idea that the money changers and vendors must have been cheating people. But that is not what Jesus means. That's not what Jeremiah means. Think about that phrase, den of robbers. The den of a robber isn't where they go to rob people. The den of a robber is where they go once the crime is committed. It's where they feel safe from the authorities. Uh, it's where they, they count up their loot and brag about what they've done. And understanding how Jeremiah used this phrase and how Jesus borrows it for his time and ours, we see why he was so mad. It wasn't high prices or uh, unfair exchange rates. It wasn't that the temple was exclusive an exclusive club that kept some people out? Wasn't that it was only open to righteous Jews and only a house of prayer for them? The issue wasn't the temple at all. It was the hearts of the people in the temple. The hypocrisy of people who lived one way during the week and another on Sunday. They came to the temple with their offerings and sacrifices thinking it would make them right with God, that it would make them okay with God. Then they go back to living however they wanted. Um, sound familiar? 
They didn't come to be transformed by worship. They came to make themselves look good. They never felt compelled to change their ways. They were just going through the motion. And that's why Jesus was mad. Jesus' anger uh, wasn't wrath. It was righteous. Righteous anger seeks restitution rather than revenge. Righteous anger seeks correction instead of retribution. As A.J. puts it in her book, Entering the Passion, the anger Jesus forbids is anger against another person. And that's the anger he forbids back in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. The anger Jesus forbids is anger against another person. But he does not forbid anger against systemic evil. Hypocrisy, exploitation, harassment, molestation, drug pushing, and so on. Such forms of injustice should make us angry, which should lead to constructive action. So Jesus was angry at people who offered empty gestures and performed rituals that had lost their real meaning and purpose. People who felt like they were safe living one way during the week and then living quote-unquote good on the weekend. Or on Sunday at least, because Friday and Saturday, well, we know what happens on Friday and Saturday. Nothing had been changed inside these folks. Nothing had been transformed. Now, is it any wonder that some of the religious leaders were scared. No wonder they wanted Jesus dead. In risking righteous anger, Jesus was challenging empty religion and hollow faith. Because those things separate us from God. Uh, Congressman and civil rights activist uh, John Lewis would have said that Jesus was getting in some good trouble. That was his famous phrase, get in good trouble. Jesus was drawing attention to the charade that temple worship had become. But his righteous anger also made him vulnerable. The risk he took in using the words of Jeremiah to stab at the heart of power also led those in power to decide to get rid of him because the crowd was beginning to agree with what he was saying. So church, what does all this mean for us? God doesn't want empty religion and hollow faith. God doesn't want our thoughts and prayers mentality. God wants our hearts and our minds and our actions to align with the sacrificial love Jesus lived and taught. God wants our devotion not to religion, or dusty doctrines, or ancient creeds written in dead languages. God wants our devotion to be to Him. God wants authentic faith that doesn't live one way on Sunday and the polar opposite the rest of the week. To put it in that old phrase, God wants us to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. God wants us to risk righteous anger in the face of injustice. To risk righteous anger in the face of systems that perpetuate oppression, violence, and lies. God wants us to stand against the powers and principalities of the world. Now, if we are not roused from complacency by poverty, gun violence, school shootings, war, and greed... There is something wrong in our devotion. If we can shrug our shoulders, walk away when we encounter racism and bigotry, the targeting of marginalized communities, if we can turn a deaf ear to the cries of people who just want to live in peace and freedom and love, we might want to watch our backs 
because we may be risking some of that righteous anger. So in the season of Lent, my prayer is that we would be transformed through worship, through devotion, through prayer, through praise. That we would see the beauty of God's eternal grace and unconditional love. May we turn from anything that is contrary to God's desire for human flourishing and building the beloved community. May we risk righteous anger as we speak truth to power, as we challenge systems that work only for the right kind of people. May we risk righteous anger and follow Jesus in proclaiming and embodying the unfolding kingdom of God in this world. The kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. May we follow Jesus despite the risk or cost because we know the life he calls us to is the life we are truly created for. And I'm going to buzz the field here a little bit because I could stop there, but uh, I saw a quote from Elie Wiesel this morning. Uh, Elie Wiesel was a Holocaust survivor and uh, an activist for peace. He believed in what's called compassionate anger. He comp connected compassionate anger to moral action. He said, righteous anger is the morally appropriate response to the effects of hatred. Righteous anger is the morally appropriate response to the effects of hatred. Wiesel's 11th commandment was, Thou shalt not stand idly by. When do we stand idly by? Why do we stand idly by? When it comes to this world, compassionate Righteous anger can be a spiritual ally. It can become hope in the face of hopelessness, provide courage and strength to resist hatred, and serve to fuel our action for the long haul. Anger without love is destructive. But anger born from compassion Anger rooted in God's love for us and for creation. That can and will change the world. So church, let's risk some righteous anger. Some compassionate anger. Let's get in a little good trouble. Let's show the world what it means to follow Jesus. Amen.
we enter into prayer this morning, we want to remember uh, Dave and Kim Jennings and their family uh, as they mourn Shirley's death. And again, that service is 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, we also want to pray for uh, Fred Weber and Judy and their family as they mourn Mary's death. Uh, so let us pray. Loving God, we pray today for all who are walking a hard road. For those whose daily paths encounter barbed wire and bombs, guns and violence. For those who didn't want to leave home but were forced to and are now called refugees, asylum seekers, illegal. For those who set out today in search of food and water. For those whose journey is shattered by economic hardship. For those whose journey is marred by sickness, pain, or despair. We also pray for those who faithfully journey alongside them. We pray for those who are making a move and beginning again. For those who are clinging to past regrets, grief, and anger. For those who are being bullied, for those who are bullying. For those who have just taken their last breath, for those who today will take their last. May this Lenten journey, with its stories about the hard places of Jesus' experience, give strength and courage to all whose journey is far from easy. May it inspire us to risk Christ's way of righteous anger, to get in a little good trouble in the face of injustice, to offer love where there is hostility and hate. As we share this journey with other Lenten travelers, we offer this prayer with the names and situations we have spoken before you, along with the prayers shared only in our hearts. As we pray the prayer Christ gave us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Whenever we confess our faith, we tell the world who we are and whose we are, and we recommit ourselves to our faith in the truth and the power of God's grace and love. Please join me as we speak the words of our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth, who gave us free will and entrusted that special world to us. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord, who was born of Mary, a humble woman, refusing to seek power and turning away the sword. Jesus died for us, the Lamb of God. He rose again on the third day, bringing life and hope to all. I believe in Christ's humble spirit at work among us and beyond us before us and after us. I believe in a church comprised of sinners and saints and perfect in the name of Jesus Christ, yet blessed to be the body of Christ. I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God calls us to lives of grateful generosity let us praise the giver of all good gifts through our offering today. If you would like to make a gift to FPC's ministry, as we seek to be faithful to God, offering baskets are located in the front and the back of the worship space. Your offering can also be mailed to the church, 
or dropped off in a church office. There is also a giving button on the FPC website. Your generosity and faithfulness are deeply appreciated. And now please join me in the dedication prayer. Let us pray. God of grace, you provide us in amazing ways. May our offering today provide for others and be used to farther Christ's ministry and mission. Amen. as we go back into the world today, let's take a little bit of Jesus' righteous anger with us. There are systemic evils that we see every day. And it's only as we express righteous anger in the face of those that this world changes. So go with the grace, the mercy, and love of God. May the joy of Christ be with you all.